one of the benefits, which there are not many in coming to Christ at 18 years of age, waiting that long, is that uh, you don't know the stories. You don't know where the world came from. And so when you read these stories, they, they don't make sense. And uh, one of the things that don't make sense is I packed my iPad in my luggage this morning, and I borrowed my wife's Bible, but I can't see this print. So we're just going to have to do what we need to do and, and tell the story as the Holy Spirit has taught the story to us. But you, you've got the kingdom of God is just in motion, and, and we've sort of parked in Matthew 10 and 11. And in and, and, and the start of 11, here you have John the Baptist, the nearest thing to a pastor that Jesus ever had. The man who said, uh, I baptize with, with water, but someone's coming after me to baptize with fire. Whom, whom sandals, whose sandal I'm not worthy to un, unhitch. Even if you go further back, that in his mother's womb, the fetus that was John the Baptist leapt for praise in his mother's womb when he, his mother and Mary met for the first time. And here's John the Baptist saying that I must decrease. He, he must increase. And, and, and here's John the Baptist standing in the water watching Jesus come toward him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth. And, and Jesus re asked of John to be baptized. And John said, No, I, I must rather be baptized by you. And, and as he does, Jesus said, no, we're going to do it my way. And I am going to be baptized by you. And John is in the water with Jesus, baptized him when the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, dove descends and says, this is my son. This is the one I love. This is the one that I uh, approve of. And everything that John did point it to Jesus, recognize Jesus, lift it up Jesus, and now John has looked Herod in the eye. You know, it's hard among the governments of the world where we've lived, where we've had presidents for life, which is just another phrase for the dictator of the week. And, and they, it's hard to proclaim the lordship of Christ when they think they are God. They think they are Lord. And proclaiming the lordship of Christ is, is high treason, treason. And here's John, baptized Jesus, heard God himself proclaim his, his love for his son. And now John is looked Herod in the eye and said, listen, I don't know who you think you are, but you're not what you think you are, and you will not take your brother's wife and have sex with her and, and survive the wrath of the coming God. And you do that in these dictator for life situations, you, you're almost always going to lose your head. And, and I can remember reading for the first time the stories of Abraham and Daniel and these young men in the fiery furnace and, and Esther born for such a time as this. And when I slid right over into the New Testament and, and John the Baptist was a continuation of every man and woman of God that I'd read thus far in the Old Testament. Here's a man of fire, of power of strength of looking you in the eye no matter who you are look the scribes and pharisees and 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 just call uh what do you call them snakes and vipers which is not uh is not a good thing all right and and uh and he he looks to the the sacred leaders in the eyes who had so bottled up God to protect their bricks and mortar, protect their children's place in school, protect their own salaries that they got in bed with Rome to such an extent that at the trial of Jesus, Pilate asked them, time and again, shall I not 
release your God to you and the leaders of what should be the, the very presence of Almighty God, the keepers of the holy of holy said in public, we have no God but Caesar. And when we go to government first, and we go to militaries first, and we go to economic first, and we go to the Republicans and the Democrats first, before we fall on our face before God, we're saying we have no God but Caesar. And it always has been and will always be rank, decaying heresy. Now, John's in prison because of two conniving ladies that his criticism was, of course, reflected upon them. And John is hours, nah, not even days away from having his head separated from his shoulders. Now, if you're reading this story for the first time, what do you expect John the Baptist to do? What do you expect him to say? I mean, when you have listened to him, and here's a man that, that ate uh, uh, wore camel hide clothes. I don't know how close you've been to a camel, but I promise you, if you're downwind of John, you know when he's coming two miles away. And, and here's a guy that doesn't bathe except when he's baptizing and, and he's eating locusts and honey. Well, you know, locusts aren't bad. Those little legs get stuck in your teeth. And, and the, you know, you can be pulling out wings for a couple of days, but you can eat a rock if you dip it in honey. And uh, so at least he had, you know, if you're going to eat a locust, that's, that's not, not, not a bad plan. And, 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 and Ruth and I have walked that whole area uh, that John ministered and can picture, you know, how far the people had to go out after him. And listen, listen to Uncle Nick. When the church closes off the altar of God from normal people, they'll go anywhere to find the altar of God open to them. And I, what I can't say this morning to 2.8 million people, 8 billion people, I can't say this. What I can say to you this morning is that the altar of God is open. Another 2 billion people on this planet don't have enough information to get to Jesus. No one is saying to them, for the most part, that the altar of God is open. Come, have access to Jesus. Have access to the will of God. Have access to the divine plan for your life. You are hearing what the vast majority of the world will never hear that for you again for the thousand times for some of you the altar of God awaits you it's open and God is waiting to meet you here we can't say that to most of the world but we can say that to you and here's John and as an 18 year old I expected John to die to face his death the way that he had lived. I expected him to look his killer, look Herod in the eye, and square his shoulders and cross his arms and, and flex all of his spiritual muscles and say, bring it on. I will die the way that I've lived, and I have lived for God, and I will die for God. And I was nauseated. When I read John in prison, spiritually run away just as far as he could in that cell. And when he heard what Jesus was doing on the outside, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus to pray for him. No. Come visit me. No. Lord, I'm ready to give my life for you. No. Here is the nearest thing to a pastor that Jesus ever had, even Jesus was to say later on, is Elijah come back to life, referring to John, and here he is facing his death, and he wants to know if Jesus is the Messiah. He sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one, or do we wait for somebody else? Well, he, he doesn't have any time to wait for anybody else. And I, I can promise you, at that point in the story, I walked away from John. I was so hurt at John 
I was so disappointed in John. I could never imagine on the earth how someone could prophesy and point people to Jesus and touch him and baptize him and hear God's voice. And John now is facing his demise and he wants to know if Jesus is whom he was told that he was or do we wait for somebody else? And I'm thinking, why? Why did you wuss out at the end? Why did you deny at the end? Why did you question at the end? And I, 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 uh, I, had, all, I had my fill of John the Baptist. He, he didn't do what I thought he should do. He didn't meet my expectations. Wow, it's even worse when Jesus doesn't do what you want him to do. I don't know why he can't stay on script. Because they went to Jesus and said, here, John wants to know whether you're the Messiah. Now, seminary students, people steeped in the Bible as professors, be honest with yourself for, you know, 30 seconds. What, if you ask, if anybody comes today and asks you to prove if Jesus is the Messiah, what kind of words are you going to use? Probably five or six syllables long, you know, you know. And uh, you're going to use all these big words that define the Alpha and the Omega and all of the, the pre-existing uh, presence of Jesus in the heavens before creation. And, and you're going to define the Christ by, by all of this holy, lofty language. And Jesus said, Go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind see. The deaf regain their hearing. The lame are walking. The lepers are being cleansed. The dead are being raised. And even, even the kingdom of God is so near that the gospel is being preached to the poorest of the poor. Why didn't Jesus stay on script? How dare he say that his Messiahship is authenticated by what he does with his followers in the marketplace? Not in the temple, not in the synagogue, not at a Bible study where only believers are allowed, but Jesus proclaims to John I am the Christ. How does he prove this? By what is going on between Jesus and his followers in the marketplaces of life. And if that is true today, and it is, can the world know through your partnership with Jesus on the streets that he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings? Without that, those words are hollow. And I, I just... I came out of Matthew 11 uh, disappointed uh, uh, in John the Baptist and confused why Jesus didn't stay on script. And so I walked away from that. And what seemed like four or five lifetimes later, uh, Ruth and I and three boys are in South Africa. We're studying, we're struggling with the will of God. And Ruth and I did a very, very, very foolish thing. We studied the book of Acts together. Missionaries should never do that. You know, uh, you know, we, we'd been we'd been in the, the service of the king all these years, and I had never heard one person say to me, not in church, not not myself, not at the mission board, not anywhere, uh, understanding that missionary word is is not particularly, you know, it is not a biblical. You can't find that word in the Bible. And Ruth and I wrote that word on a piece of paper, and we read the book of Acts together. And then for us, we wrote down a definition of what that word means. But, uh, about us in the presence of Almighty God and that we were to go and find those who have little or no access to the kingdom of God and give them access to the kingdom of God and those who said yes to the kingdom we invest in and those who say no we let their no be no and let them walk away let them walk away 
And, and the moment that we wrote that on a piece of paper, we called our leadership and said, we're in a place where they've had missionaries for 300 years. We need to go to a place where they haven't had missionaries for the most part for 2,000 years. And two months later, we had moved again to our third and fourth languages to uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, starting this journey into Somalia. But before I, we went there in August, I went to Nairobi for a meeting in June of that year. I, I, uh, I, I was very uh, surprised and chagrined to find out that Baptists love to meet internationally as much as they do locally. <laughs> Folks, I have gone to meetings to talk about the meeting. <laughs> and I can't remember what this meeting was about. But an older mentor in our organization came to me and said, I hear that you, Ruth, and the boys are praying about uh, opening the work with Somalis. Isn't it, isn't it horrible? Isn't it horrible that in 1991, not a single one of my colleagues from our uh, large denomination had ever attempted to share the gospel inside of Somalia with one person. In the files, there was a piece of paper and half of the page was written on where our leader went in there in 1984 to survey the country and he came to these conclusions. Number one, Somalia is a Muslim country. Now there's news. There's something we didn't know. And, and, and he concluded, he said, uh, you cannot openly be Southern Baptist missionaries in Somalia. So it's obviously God's will not to go there. That's a war my generation has fought so that you all don't have to fight it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> And, and he came to me and he said, uh, Nick, have you ever met a Muslim? What's that got to do with it? The answer is no. Have you ever met a Somali? No. He said, well, you might want to do this before you move your family and go to the most dangerous place on the planet today. And short Story is he had connections in the United Nations and Red Cross and he could get me in to the newest, largest refugee camp uh, down on, near Mombasa. 10,000 Somalis, college students, university professors, politicians, policemen. It was the cream of the crop that had enough money to pay bribes to get out. Somebody had got there before I did, if I haven't told you this, and they had done they, what they thought 10,000 Somalis needed more than anything else was 10,000 Somali Bibles, and the Somalis were so happy to get them. They, it was rainy season, and they made sidewalks out of the Word of God, and they put a case of Bibles in every latrine so that they would have toilet paper. I do not, I do not think that was a successful Bible distribution program. I don't think that's something you go home and brag about. And so he said, I can get you in there for two weeks with your background in disaster relief in South Africa. I can get you in there. You can look at what they need. You can start uh, uh, rubbing up against them. You, you can listen to them. Uh, you, you can begin to suggest projects that we can do among them once you can get across the border. And I, I love new experiences. Uh, I think I take appropriate risk. So basically I said, just give me the ticket. I'm sold on this and he grabbed me by the shirt front and pulled me right into his embrace and he said Nick I know what you're like well you don't know what's coming next but you know it's not going to be very nice and he said I want you to go in there and touch this and feel this and taste this and listen to this and and learn from this and I want you to keep your mouth shut for two weeks and discern what the Holy Spirit is saying go there be quiet and learn and I flew down to Mombasa I took a taxi about 30 minutes to this camp it has 
two huge gates coming in and out. The only way that you can get in and out, it's got 10 feet chain link fences with razor coiled wire all over the top. On the outside in the, in the, in the, in the bush, uh, uh, Kenyan soldiers are uh, 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 marching the parameter to make sure none of these folks get out. And I get in this place, immediately a, a young university student uh, befriended me named Abdi Aziz and, and his English much purer than my Kentucky uh, uh, accented English and, and he's introducing me to tribal elders, to police chiefs, uh, to university professors and, and I, I just sense, I thought, wow, this is going to be easy. Doors are just opening everywhere. So after three days, my arrogance knows no bounds. Well, that's the advice we give to new workers. They ask us, what's the one thing we need when we go to the mission field? We say, bury your arrogance and get some humility. And maybe God's sending you out as much for you to learn as, as he's sending you out to share the gospel with somebody else. And if you know it all, you won't depend on the person that knows it all. All right? And that's free too. And, and so I go in there, and after three days, I've got this figured out. I don't need a week. I don't need two weeks. And I say to Abdi Aziz, I said, Abdi, can I ask you a, a very important question? He said, uh, sure, uh, Dr. Nick. I said, I just want to know, have you heard of or, or have, have you known of uh, 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 my, my friend Jesus? And Abdi went nuts. He just began to throw up his arms and yell and men started running toward us and they started pulling on each other's beard and on each other's clothes and they're waving their arms and, and this is going on now uh, for over 30 minutes and my back is being pressed against this chain, line, uh, chain link fence and all I can hear is Nick over here and Ripken over there and Jesus here and Jesus that and, and you can just feel this anger building and my heart is pounding in my chest and I'm thinking why uh, why didn't I just keep my mouth shut why didn't I just listen uh, 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 these folks are right on the verge of I, I knew 110% I was not going to survive that first encounter with Islam. And I remember saying to God, Lord, uh, Ruth and the boys don't even know I'm here. But Lord, somehow, somehow let them know this is where I died. And at least maybe they can come and get some pieces and do something with it and, and uh, bury it someplace and, and, and at least the, the boys know what happens to their dad and, and they're arguing. You see, what I, I didn't know Somali language. I didn't know the culture. We've lived already over 12 years in sub-Saharan Africa where people are, are kind and they're gentle and they're responsive and they'll borrow money to feed your family and go without meat for for a month so that our kids can have meat for the weekend. They, they carry beds over at least two mountains so we have something to sleep in. And every saucer, every plate, every, every utensil that we use still has the, the price sticker on the bottom of it where they had borrowed money in order to host us. They're responsive. They, they listen. They care. They want to be in the kingdom of God. Sub-Saharan Aaron Africans are like my beautiful wife. They're kind. They're gentle. They're giving. They're sacrificial. Somalis are like my family. <laughs> We're always in your business, and we always know what's better for you than you know for yourself. And we're loud and we're expressive and, and we always talk over, no, over one another. And, and so I, I'm misreading the situation, but I know I'm going, uh, I, I'm not going to survive this encounter. And they fight and they argue. And then the crowd after 30 minutes, a lifetime breaks around me. And, and I've already got the chain link stuff making impressions in my uh, my back and, and Abdi comes and every ounce of his body is just ferocity and anger. And I thought, hey, here, here it comes and here's Baba. And, and, and he looked at me and he said with just 
what I interpret as just utter hatred in his voice. Dr. Ripken, we don't know your friend Jesus. But Mahmoud thinks he's heard about him. And he's really sure that he lives in the refugee camp up the road. So if you'll go out the gate and go left and go to one more kilometer to the next camp, ask for him there, we're pretty certain you'll find Jesus there. And I said, thank you so much. And I went out the gate and I went right. And I got me a taxi and I went to Mombasa. I got me a plane and I flew to Nairobi. I didn't even get out of the airport. I got the next plane to South Africa and I flew home. And I said to God, long before you ever heard of Black Honk Down, long before you ever heard of Somali pirates, I said to God, Lord, you want these people? You can have them. <laughs> I'm going back to the real world, to the kind world and the gentle world. And uh, I, I've, but you know what? The moment my backside hit that taxi seat, I was so ashamed. My dad and mom raised six boys, and the seventh child was a girl about the time I went to college. And, uh, and my dad never raised his boys to run away. My dad had calluses on his hands. He's a bricklayer farmer, calluses on his feet, and his whole heart was encased in one big callus. And I just thought, oh, I am so Thankful that my daddy is not here to see his son. The first time, the first time that I knew that my faith was going to cost me everything, I ran away. I ran away. And I'm flying home 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm saying, what am I going to say to Ruth? How am I going to look three young boys in the eye and tell them we're not going because their daddy's afraid. And I've run away, and I'm not going back. And somewhere between 2 and 4 in the morning, I can't even picture another person being on that airplane. I said to God, if you give me one more chance, Lord, I promise you I'm not going to run away again. I'd rather die than to feel like this. And I remember sitting on the plane and recalling this story. And, and as much as you can spiritually, uh, I communed with the dead and told John the Baptist how sorry I was for judging him when I did not understand that situation. What are you running away from? What do you need to be running toward? In 30-some years of doing this stuff, uh, uh, for us to have missed going to the nations would have meant missing Jesus himself. To have missed crossing the street and crossing the oceans with the gospel is to miss understanding the Bible itself. That's what's true for us. You'll determine what's true for you. And, and we have been among hundreds. I've said Ruth and I, with over 300 Muslims who have come to Christ. And three things figure in their conversion. Uh, 90 plus percent of the time, they have dreams and visions that send them on a spiritual pilgrimage. If they are literate, ladies, this is good news and it's horrible news. They'll read the Bible. Uh, if they're literate, God will miraculously put that Bible in their hands and, and they will read it three to five times before they say yes to Jesus. That's the great news. The bad news is in Yemen where, where illiteracy for men is 45%, for women it's 90%. In the Swat Valley of Pakistan and in those mountains of the Taliban and Afghanistan it's the same. We know that for Muslims where there is no Bible, there is no salvation. And when women are not taking the Bible stories to Muslim women, they have no access to the Word of God nor to the kingdom of God because we're not telling them as women and they're not going to hear it from me. There's going to be about 700 billion women die and go to hell because we're afraid to take our children. We're afraid to go as singles. We're afraid to go as teams and take the gospels as Jesus commanded to the ends of the earth. We're going to say that to one-fifth 
of the world's population. And, and then God sends somebody like he sent Joseph to Pharaoh, Ananias to Saul, Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you understand what you're dreaming about? Do you understand what you're reading? And, and they say no, and they, they, they explain the kingdom of God to them and lead them into Christ. We have been in India among low caste Hindus and have observed 20 to 40,000. Now, folks, this is not missionary mathematics. 20 to 40,000 people a month being baptized. And these young Hindu believers, they're from Hindu background, are going by fours and sixes and eights into these villages. And they're calling them together at the appropriate time at night and uh, of the evening. And, and they, they, the whole village, they, they, they say, we've come with, with information from the God. Well, Hindus love gods. They have 300 million of them. And they have major gods and minor gods and, and the whole village will sit there and they will ask them, how many of you are sick? And everybody's hand will go up because there's one doctor for every one million low caste Hindu. How many of you want to be healed? And the equal number of hands are going up and they're walking in the midst of them and just like Matthew 11 the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, and everything that God has ever done, God has not taken a vacation. He's not retired. He's not on a pension. Everything that God has ever done, you can depend that he's still doing it. And then asking them if they want to enter in to the Christ that healed them. And, and just like with Islam, there's great news and there's really troubling things there. Every church that we could discover prior to 1970 in China started with miracles of healing. I myself have gone to a village next to a house church and asked those villages, who are those people meeting over there? And they say, oh, those are those Jesus people. Uh, they're the ones that when a little girl died here, they came and prayed for her and she got up and went out to pray. play. That's who those people are from the voices and the testimony of pagans. And I'm listening, uh, arrive in China, the first question they ask me among the house churches, Nick, has Jesus made it to other countries or has he just made it to China so far? Nick, they said, 40% of everybody here, 170 church planters, evangelists, men, women, rural, urban, highly educated, oral communicators, church planners, evangelists, pastors, deacons, elders, teachers. 40% of us have already been in prison for three years. They said, Nick, prison is our theological seminary. <laughs> How many degrees do you want, Nick, while you're in China? I said, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'd stay and get an extra degree, but you know, Ruth misses me, and, and it'd break her heart if I don't get home. So uh, next time. Thank you very much. Third time I've said that. And, and, uh, and, 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 and to see that every time a movement of 10 million people get to a, a body of Christ, a house church of 30 or more, they split for the right reasons and form two new bodies and, and, and they meet different days of the week, different hours of that day in different homes trying to stay one step away, not making it easy on the bad guys to find them and, and put them away for three years. I was with an 83-year-old guy. He was in prison three years when he became the first Christian in his village. In prison for three years when he planted the first church in his village. And now when I met him, three days before I got there, he came from prison for the third time because his, he was a, a leader of, the, of one of those massive movements and they put him in prison and his blood pressure went so high they didn't want him to be a martyr in jail so they let him out of prison. I meet him three days later. He's completely healed, normal blood pressure, but God needed him out of prison to talk to me and to share with me and to teach me that everything that God has ever done, God is still doing. He had an extra pair of underwear to his name. And he's going from church to church encouraging 
six or seven generations of his disciples, and he was the richest man I've ever met in my life. Smile never left his face. Squatting in the corner, praising God with his hymns and songs and as he watched me uh, learn from his Timothy and learn from his Timothy and learn from his Timothy and learn from his Timothy. His bank account were those guys. And they asked me about you. Since Jesus has made it to America, how do you do this thing called church? And I, I, I told them about the pulpits, and I told them about the praise team, and I told them about the gathering like this, and, and I, I, I told them uh, about our, our buildings, and, and, and I'm there, and, and here are men and women with scars on their body from suffering for Jesus, and they've been tortured, they've been in prison, they've been beaten, they've been starved, and here are some of the toughest men and women I've ever met, and all of a sudden they're just crying like babies. I mean, it's not just a tear or two. I mean, it's that vacuum sweeper sound where you're sucking air. They're sobbing. And, and, and I, I said something, and it just, it just broke their hearts, and they just started sobbing. And I said, uh, what, what's wrong with you? And they said, you don't understand? You don't know? I said, Ruth's not here. I don't know what I said wrong. And they said, you really don't understand? You don't see? I said, Ruth's not here. How can I? You know? How? They, they, they said, we, we, we don't understand, Nick. Why does God love his children in America more than he loves his children in China? I was dumbfounder. I said, what are you talking about? They said, you don't see? I said, I don't have a clue. They were so hurt, and they were so angry at me, and they gathered around me in, in a press of, 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 of uh, like a spiritual wall, and, and, and they said to me, Nick, you don't see, you don't understand. I said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. They said, which is the greatest miracle, Nick? You, you, you've watched us. God maybe heals 100,000 Chinese and a 100 of them figure out that their healing came from a God and maybe three or four figure out that his name is Jesus and because of that healing, they enter into the kingdom of God. And yet you tell us that every time you throw out a shoulder, uh, had 11 knee surgeries, that you tell us you can call a Baptist deacon from overseas in Jacksonville, Florida, and tell him of your current problem, and you can fly in there on a Sunday, see him on a Monday, have tests on Monday afternoon, and on Tuesday morning, he'll do surgery and fix you up and send you back out, and you have access to that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is the greatest miracle, son? Which is the greatest miracle? You've watched us, and I did. I watched them one morning, not knowing what they were doing. Out of 170 leaders, they had seven Bibles. And they've led 10 million people to Christ. Don't you tell me what you can't do. Don't you tell me what God can't do. That's a better way of saying that. And they said, you've watched us tear our Bibles in shreds so that every leader here could go at home with at least one book of the Bible. And they walk here to Dr. Orr, have you taught the book of Genesis? And if he says no, they tear it out and give it to him. They, they, they ask you, have you, have, you, have, you, have you taught Ezekiel? No, I, I've never had the book of Ezekiel in my church, in my village. And they tear it out and give it to him. And they ask this musician lady, have you sung God's hymn book, the Psalms, uh, uh, in your village, in your church? And, and she says, I didn't even know we had a hymn book in the Bible called the Psalms. And they tear it out and they give it to her. And I watched as every Every evangelist, every church planner, every deacon, elder, pastor, teacher got, was going to go home from that meeting with at least one complete book of the Bible. And I remember thinking, oh, Lord, this isn't fair. I just watched a guy get third John. 
You know, can you imagine this professor gets the gospel of John and he gets Philemon. <laughs> you probably just cost him his job. You know, and you've watched us, you've watched us tear our Bibles and shred so that everybody can have at least one book whole, complete of the Bible. And you tell us where you live in Ethiopia, you have seven different versions of the Bible on your desk just for yourself. What is the greatest miracle, son? You tell us that your pastors can stand in the pulpits of all denominations in America and they can preach 24 hours a day seven days a week and you're telling us nobody gets beaten nobody goes to jail nobody gets tortured nobody loses their job loses their kids and you watch us 40% of us have already gone to prison for our faith and we expect to go again and if we live long enough go again and, and again which is the greatest miracle son You've watched us, and I have. I've done this from North Korea all through China. I've watched them set four people, four believers, with their knees touching each other in a house. And when they sing, they move their lips, and they don't let any sound come out. Because if those songs go through the paper-thin walls of the apartment or out the door of their house hut, and anybody hears it, the security police are going to be there taking them to prison that night. And they said to us, you, 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 you're telling us that your praise teams can sing hymns 24 hours, seven days a week. You have hymn books. You have things in electronic form. You even have your own TV and radio stations, which is the greatest miracle, son. You, you, you're telling us that if the church wants to, it can meet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and nobody gets beaten, nobody gets tortured, nobody has to go to prison, they don't lose their kids, they don't lose their health, they don't lose their freedom, they don't lose their lives. Which is the greatest miracle, son? I stood in this farming compound surrounded by 170 of your brothers and sisters and I cried like a baby because I've called common what is a miracle from the throne of God and looking at us see what I've what we've tried to do this week is to open up a mirror for you to look at what God is doing among the nations what I'm trying to do this morning is to hold up a mirror so you can see yourself. You can see yourself the way that the persecuted church sees you. And what do we call this? We call this normal. On Sunday morning, we call it common. You know what we call this? We call this what I deserve. God owes this to me. And if I don't like the music and I don't like the pastor, if I don't like that sermon on tithing or evangelizing or whatever, I can go somewhere else. This is normal. This is common. Uh, this was made for me. And I can take it or, or I, I can leave it. She was about 26 years of age, lived among the Taliban when she came to Christ. Long story, long story. She, unlike anybody uh, Ruth and I have met in the Muslim world, she led over 30 Muslim women to Christ, and she's gathering them. And the Taliban are out to kill her for three reasons. One, she, she turned her back on Islam and came to Christ. Secondly, she's, in their words, converting other Muslims. And third, she is representing women from her part of the world who are raped and molested by the Taliban and she's taking the Taliban to court and holding them accountable for what they've been doing. This is a lady you don't want to mess with. She's about four foot ten and a half and I stayed out of reach. <laughs> I didn't want to get within her grasp because this is one tough woman. And the United Nations was trying to resettle her because there were so many fatwas and death threats against her. They, they were encouraging her to go to America. I'm begging her not to. And I didn't have your permission, didn't, didn't need it. 
But I, I remember the words of Jesus when he said, when persecution comes upon you, go to Germany, go to America, go, go to Mexico. Is that what he said? No. He said, go to the next village, in the next city, in the next village. And Jesus never one time extracted a person from their people group. Matter of fact, he said to John the Baptist, John the Baptist in prison, blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. He said, John the Baptist, die like the man of God you've been. John, I can get more from your death now than I can get if you live another 30 or 40 years. If you will die for me now, John, 2,000 years plus later, they're going to be sitting in a school somewhere in Texas talking about your testimony, talking about your life singing God's praises because of you John the Baptist if you will die for the kingdom of God right now I can get you out John knew it Jesus knew it but if God can gain more by our death than by our life will you say blessed be the name of the Lord that's in the God job description you can't change it. You're trying, but you can't change it. And, and so I'm begging her to stay there. She made it to St. Louis before I made it back to Kentucky where we were staying after our, we were there for healing and, and then for this research for about three years. And, and immediately upon getting uh, back to the States, uh, I, I gave her contact information my wife. Uh, she called this young lady, flew her in uh, from St. Louis to Kentucky, and we turned her loose in that Baptist college, and they'll never be the same since. Man, she terrified them. <laughs> they were so scared to death of the Holy Spirit, I thought they were going to die. But, uh, uh, and what we did, and I, I wouldn't advise you to do this, but on Saturday night, we took her to church. She's never been to church, not in her life. But we just want her to see what this is going to look like on Sunday morning. We're going to say to her, here's how we're going to be setting. Here's what things will, how that will do this. And, and, and you got to expect men and women who are not even married are going to be sitting together. You're, you're for the first time in your life, you're going to be uh, squished together in a, in a mixed audience. And on Sunday morning, for the first time in her 30 some years of life, she goes to the body of Christ. That's for us a good day. And this church unusual for them they started off the service with a baptism a whole family father mother two teenage daughters and a, a younger son and as this pre-service activity is taking place this young lady this muslim background believer she's having i thought a panic attack and she's just all over the place she's sitting between ruth and i and i whisper to her is this more than you can take i can i understand you know it's men are sitting all around you they could reach out and touch you and if you need to go out uh ruth will ruth will be glad to go out with you and and she whispers uh, this loud stage whisper and she said i can't believe it you're telling me you're telling me that in public in public a whole family's going to be baptized into Jesus and and he's not going to be killed he's not going to lose his wife and his children uh, they're not going to make her marry a Muslim man they're not going to marry his daughters off to an imam of the mosque and you're telling me that that no one here is going to be beaten go to jail you're you're telling me that that this is a regular experience that the, this is normal she said I, if I was to go back where I'm from and, and tell them what I saw this morning, I would lose my entire witness because people would know I'm lying because there can't be such a miracle on this planet. She said, I'm, I think I'm going to stand up and shout. I said, girl, stand up and shout. <laughs> if, they, if they kick you out, Ruth will go with you. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and she, she looked around and she said, why is everybody just sitting here? Why are they just quiet? Why aren't they standing up and clapping and yelling? Don't they understand this is a miracle unknown to almost all of us in the persecuted world? We could not imagine that this could ever take place. Why, why are they just sitting here? 
You see, Ruth and I are leaving you in a couple hours. And when I go to bed at night, and you tell me you don't believe that God is sending Muslims dreams and visions, that he's not miraculously, I'm telling you miraculously, putting a Bible in their hands, and you don't want to believe that he, he's sending today Joseph to prison for the sake of the salvation of, of both Egypt and the Jews in Egypt. You, you don't believe that, that, that God would ever take somebody like old man Ananias into the room with that killer Saul who is on his way to become the Apostle Paul. It doesn't, I'm not going to lose sleep tonight if you don't believe that God is doing such miraculous things for Muslims because that seems to be their miracles. And, and I'm not going to lay awake tonight if you don't believe that, that, that God is healing Hindus by the tens of thousands. That, that's their miracles. Uh, I, 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 I'm not even uh, going to have to take a, uh, indigestion medicine if, if you don't believe that when Chinese are arrested, believers are arrested, put in prison, uh, the majority of people that are coming to faith in that segment of history is because they were arrested, just like it says in Matthew 10. Uh, uh, they're going to arrest you and take you be before the secular pyres and authority. Go. I am sending you as a witness to them. They understand the truthfulness of that in their lives today. And they're sharing Jesus throughout the prisons of China. And if you don't want to believe that, that's okay. That's not your miracle. But what are you doing with this? What are you doing with this school? What are you doing with your church? Is this, you think it's normal? And it's common. And God help you, you, you think it's what you deserve. Uh, I want to remind you of something. The altar of God is open. And Sam's going to come and play. And our, our, um, our praise team before long are going to be standing here again without fear of torture, imprisonment, and death. And they're going to be singing God's praises out. And I want you to hear what I can't say to almost four point some billion people on the planet that I can say to you, the altar of God is open. What are you going to do? Do you need to come and pray? We have a whole list of things that they have worked hard for you of mission opportunities of ways of serving and and some of you uh, have heard for the thousand probably maybe the thousandth time uh, this week that Jesus commands us to go to Jerusalem Judea Samaria and the ends of the earth and you know that he has taken your heart and he stuck a pin in the map and says that's where your heart belongs and you have been disobedient Listen to me, the altar of God is open. Let's get obedient. Let's get obedient. Now, a lot of you, you might just want to need to just sit where you are and wrestle with God. But somewhere in the deserts of this world and the cities of this world that don't know the name of Jesus like Jacob, you need to build an altar and give people access to the kingdom of God. You need to put some rocks on top of rocks. Uh, counselors say about my sweet wife that you put her in a desert by herself. Uh, she is such a person of worship and praise that she'll gather rocks together just to have somebody to worship with. Uh, I know I have a, a, a rare follower of Jesus. And uh, the one thing I fear the most is to ever try to make her choose between me and Jesus, I know who she's going to follow. I know who she's going with. Folks, the altar of God's open. And maybe you just need to come and stand in praise. Maybe you need to come and just say, here's what God's been commanding me to do. I want to go on record with someone and say, uh, help me, help me. Even though I don't know whether I'll come back, 
I've heard the story. I've heard Jesus speak. I don't have to come back, but I've got to go. And some of you might have the hardest task in the world, and you have parents that don't believe. Let us pray with you. Crossing that street to the, your own family and crossing the street to the next race of people is the hardest thing to do on this planet for the sake of the kingdom of God, and we're doing it very poorly. Billy Graham died a few days ago. They asked him 10 years ago, what's the number one hindrance to the kingdom of God? He said, racism. Racism. Look around you. Until th this, this school looks more like the culture than any school or church that Ruth and I have been in. Folks, don't waste it. It's not diversity that you're celebrating. What you're celebrating is that your diversity gives you opportunity to go among peoples that almost no church or no other school has had that kind of opportunity. Listen to me. The altar of God is open. Stand with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... Uh, we do not want to call a single person that you are not calling. We don't want to guilt. We don't want to manipulate. We just want to get right with you. Myself, first of all. I want to lead my wife and I into the next chapter of whatever that is. And I thank you, God, that for us, the altar of God remains open. Father, some of us are broken because our homes are broken. And we don't know how to bring healing. Help them to hear that you await them. And there are resources in this room that will pray with them, walk with them, go with them, and bring healing to a family that has never known anything but distrust and hatred and division. And, and we've gone to bed at night hearing our parents fight. And that is our lullaby as we go to sleep. And others, Father, have held Jesus unto themselves because they're fearful that you might bless the people that they hate the most. Help them to hear that the altar of God knows no race, no creed, no language group. It is the altar of God, the gateway into the presence of God into heaven itself. Father, this school has worked hard worked very hard to make opportunities available to its students to embrace the nations from this place to the ends of the earth. Lord, uh, help them have the courage to say, though none go with me, uh, I still will follow. Father, I thank you that the altar of God is open. Usher us now again in the presence of Almighty God, even Jesus the Christ. Amen.